Here we have him, James Proctor, joining Tour Life once again. James, what's going on, brother? How y'all doing? Hey, we're doing good. We're living one day at a time over here, one day at a time. Um, I guess, yeah, first question. What, what's with the new nicknames? What's going on here? What's happening? I don't know. I mean, they kind of took the... Uh was the proctologist <laughs> yeah, and I heard they that really one. ran with that one. Um, I'm not going to say it's my favorite, but you know, <laughs> sorry, I'm like hearing, Oh, there we go. That's better. You good? Is that good? Yeah. We can do, do you fine. have a nickname that you've had in the past. Maybe when you were a kid, I mean, everyone like in high school, it was just proctor or proc. That was, uh, people didn't even know my first name. Mm. Yeah. That's just, that's just what it was. And so, you know, not really. I wasn't a huge nickname guy. It was just Proctor or Proc. This guy Z Hutcher says that one stinks. Um, I think <laughs> as, as your, your first your first nickname that people are you know disc golf running something into the ground on coverage. We've never seen that done before. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, hey, congratulations! I want to say that this is your first big win. If you want to come at me on that, that's fine. Swedish Open, I know, big win overseas. A little bit of a smaller field doesn't really have the history that Maple Hill does. Do you agree that this is your really first big like staple? win that you've had on tour i think swedish open was a big win i agree it's not the same event that maple was i i think maple is my biggest win yeah and i don't think you can argue that but you know at the time like swedish had paul it had rick it mm -hmm. had calvin niklas like there's some players in that field um so you know in my mind it was a big win at the time it was my biggest win so you know i might push back on that but i will agree you know maple is my biggest win and it's not it's not close i For mean sure. it, building block too swedish open win oh, you know yeah. what i mean to I, have I was, that experience i was just saying like if you had to pick a tournament to win outside of the majors i think a lot of people are picking maple hill like i think that yeah. is one of the the events that a lot of guys want to win that event i mean heck we saw like what maddie did last year right when he won it like that yeah. he was super stoked that it happened at that event so uh, that's what i meant by that kind of for sure um, for sure i agree with you there 100 percent uh so something came out on social media i think it was from another round disc golf, or another is there another round is that what it is yeah, another round. They messaged you because uh, they saw on coverage that you kind of on that before the big putt from the drop zone, you kind of paused and like looked down at your wrist. I would love for you to kind of share that story and maybe share like what what the meaning of that is for everyone and what it is that you were looking at. Yeah, so I have a wristband on my wrist. I haven't taken it off and since he passed so actually before he passed away. Um, when he was diagnosed with cancer, we all got wristbands. And um, he was probably the closest friend and mentor I've ever had. Um, you know, he was the principal at the school that I taught at and we just had a very, very close relationship. Um, and he was a professional and semi-professional tennis player. So he, you know, he kind of got the, the competitiveness and sports aspect of kind of what my life was becoming. And so I was, you know, I would, I would talk to him a lot and, and about different tournaments and situations. And, uh, he passed away from cancer, in 2022 um and so you know he's just someone that i still talk to all the time and and so that was um you know he would say weak ass all the time something if something was bad or if you did something wrong he would call you a weak ass he would say this was weak ass and so excuse my language but um so the wristband says uh weak ass on it and sometimes when i'm really want to make a putt or I feel like I'm going to miss it or, you know, so I'll just talk to him and I'll promise him that I won't be a weak ass and I'll, you know, uh, give it my best. And so that's what that was. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure if, if you go back, maybe you can catch it. I don't do it on every putt. I think I did it on the putt on 16 as well. Um, but yeah, that's uh yeah. Another round reached out to me cause they had noticed it. I think from Gannon's video that Gannon filmed cause that was kind of uncut yeah, and you could just right follow me the whole you. time. Yeah. And uh, so that's what that was. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I, I would love for like more of these stories to kind of come out. Cause it kind of, it kind of gives a little bit of like uh, more context and get, you know, gives something now for people to kind of pay attention to moving forward. So that was, I, I love that you kind of shared that with everyone as well. Um, yeah. 
Let's jump into it. Jump putt controversy here. Um, you know, it is something that I, everyone loves to kind of throw in their two cents. It's a little bit of like the Monday morning after the Sunday football games, everyone kind of throwing in, blaming the refs, blaming this call, whatever it is. Um, whenever someone jump putts and really whenever someone jump putts, well, uh, yeah. it seems to always kind of come out. Now we've seen it with like Kristen Tatar where she just literally doesn't jump putt anymore uh, because there was so much, uh, people pushing her saying that her putt was illegal. Chris Dickerson has come out and said that he stopped doing step putts now because of, uh, he doesn't want to kind of follow that fine line. Thankfully size, you can throw the photo up. Thankfully someone came out and actually showed a still frame of the disc out of your hand and your foot still on the pad. So it was a completely legal throw for all those people that want to say that it was illegal. It was a completely legal throw. Um, but what are your, what are your thoughts we on it? Shop that for you, by the way. <laughs> yeah. You always big size time. is pretty good. Size is pretty good. Um, but yeah, what, what are your thoughts on it? Cause it is, it is something that people love talking about so much. So what are your thoughts on, jump putting step putting should the circle be pushed back what do you think so i actually hadn't heard anything about that putt and me foot faulting um i don't pay attention to i don't even have reddit so i know a lot of people have like come up and said stuff on reddit and i haven't heard anything about that i haven't seen just from and i don't pay attention to a lot of it i've seen some step putts that are like ooh, that's questionable but i mm -hmm. you know it's it's the integrity of the putt. They're not trying to cheat. I, I've never had a problem with it. I, you know, if you're outside the circle and you make the putt, you deserve to make the putt. I don't have an issue with it. I, I've never seen a jump putt look egregious. So I'm, I was, I'm kind of confused that people even had noticed it or broke it down frame to frame. But then again, you know, I, I have no idea. I've never paid that close attention to it. Um, as far as like the circle, you know, I've heard talks about a 15 meter circle. I have no issue with it. I'm not someone who jump putts at 11 meters. You know, I, I, that putt was uphill, you know, it, it, it's pretty far back there. So obviously I jumped that one, but I think it's interesting. I think it's, it's worth a shot to, to scoot the circle back. I think very rarely do, you know, I, certain people who put right on that edge of circle line who are asking, who are hoping to be right outside as opposed to right inside. Um, even then, you know, they're not making a hundred percent of them. So I don't have an issue with it. Um, but I would be curious to see how it played a further circle. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I, I obviously also, go ahead. Yeah. I also think that from my experience watching the best putters in the world, I think the best putters don't jump from circles edge. Yeah. You know, I think it's the people who struggle with putting that can't from that distance that can't wait to get there because they think it helps them. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And the, and the people who are, are really good at putting like Gannon's not jumping from 30 something feet. He can. And sometimes we see him to get a little more pepper on it or something, but I mean, take it back to even like, like Ricky or, or Macbeth. I mean, the greatest winning putters that we've seen in, in this generation, they're not jumping from that. It, I feel like, moving it back you're gonna have the same problem you know yeah and exactly yeah go ahead i was just gonna say like you know do we move it back for mpo not fpo because i think hmm. fpo you know they would suffer more than we would benefit from a farther circle um and yeah i mean you're right i think you know I don't see a huge issue with, with someone letting go of the putter and their foot is a half inch off the ground. I don't, you know, it's, it's sort of like in, in baseball now, how we get so close to, did he actually tag the guy in the replay and all that? Like, is that the spirit of the game? I, it's wishy-washy. I don't know, but I, I have never, I am, I didn't know that people were still framing that putt, calling oh, it a foot fault. They love doing it. They still frame everyone. They love that. That's doing funny anything. to me. Yeah. I get it with the step putts because half of your body's over the lie, but with a jump putt, like both your feet are back there. Yeah. I don't know. It's interesting, but. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I think my comparison, baseball's a good one. My comparison is the NFL rule of the force out, right? They used to have this mm-hmm. rule of where if you went up and caught the ball near the sideline and your feet were going to come in contact in bounds, but some player pushed you while you're in, in the air and forced you out of bounds, that used to be a catch. And it used to be a very, very tough rule for the refs to decide like, was he going to get his feet down? Was he not? So they just completely did away with it. Yeah. That's what I think should happen here is just completely do with the way of the rule. If you want to jump from behind your disc and throw the disc in midair, go for it. Right. And now <laughs> I think, run. now I think this would be kind of silly at the 33, because then you would start getting like the Michael Jordan run up and people would be launching and getting like 15 feet away from the basket and tossing it yeah. But at a certain distance. Right. Let's, let's figure out that is, what is it? 60 feet. If someone wants to get a 10 yard heads, uh, running start and launch from 60 feet and jump in the air and toss, if anything, that's like, that's like probably one of the cooler things you could do in disc golf. Like that's actually a cool thing. If someone got, you just going like this. Uh. Yeah. And we even talked about this too, is like what this opens up, James, is this now means that if you're stuck behind a tree, you could run, jump behind your disc and lean out around the tree and throw around trees. If people want to do this one I think it takes away the whole, because let's be honest, who actually knows if it's a legal jump putt or set? I don't know. When you watch it, you have no idea to your eye. You have no no idea. Like you were saying, half the people thought you were illegally jump putting here and clearly you weren't. So it's impossible to tell. And then also we, we now add a little bit of athleticism, something that is, uh, you know, if people want to jump from behind their disc and throw the disc. I mean, go for it. Why not? I think you hit it on the nail too. Uh, nobody's calling people on footfalls who it's are impossible. missing a bunch of putts too. It's yeah. when you start making a bunch of putts, people are like, something's wrong here, man. Like <laughs> something's going on with this guy that I don't know. And yeah. I don't like it. I dealt with it big time. Um, when I, back in the day, James, you know this, I used to step putt and I was pretty dirty with it. Yeah. And then finally people were like, no, that's, that's illegal. And people came at me hard, but I was just like, bad, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Just I remove, just, remove yeah. it. So it doesn't, it doesn't have, it doesn't have any impact on the game. I just, I think, you know, I already have no issue with it from 33, 40 feet, whatever. Like you make the putt, you earned it. That's a, it's not like the putt got that significantly easier if your foot was a little bit off the ground. And I think if we scoot the circle back to 45 feet, the putts are that much more difficult already. Like I'm not going to have any issue with somebody being borderline, you know, Mm -hmm. whether it was foot was on the ground or not, like they're earning that stroke. Putting's hard enough. So I don't know. I I think it's, I think it's funny that people were calling that a football, but well, if you missed the putt, no one would have, would have cared. I'll say that no one would have looked, no one would have said that it was a football and you still miss, but yeah. um, All right. And another thing I want to talk about here score watching. Did I hear this right? Did you have no idea what the score was? I had no idea. Okay. There's, there's been multiple winners. Now we've heard it from Eagle. We've heard it from a lot of FPO players. Um, I'm trying to think of another person that doesn't look at scores off the top of my head. There's been a couple Eagle Eagles. The last one that I remember definitely said it. Um, I think there was an event with Kristen. Kristen didn't know that she won Waco. Um, so what, what is it? What, do you just feel like the courses and the way disc golf is currently set up? Because if you said that in golf, you would be insane. Like everyone knows what they have to do in golf down the stretch. Do you think there's not a lot of decision-making in disc golf to where if you're winning by one or if you're losing by one, it doesn't really change how you I mean, play? A couple of things went into that decision. First of all, I know you're not safe going into 18. So it's not like I'm going to lay up a pot on 17. I want every stroke I can get. Mm-hmm. certain courses, you know, like I'm just trying to think USCGC is one, um, you know, OTB in Stockton, that whole 17 can be dangerous. So those holes, maybe I would want to know going into 17, this course, I'm trying to birdie 17, no matter what, cause I know anything can happen on 18. And then I would have asked, had I thrown a good tee shot on 18 and I would have had an option to go for the Island on the second, I would have asked, I would have wanted to know. But given where my tee shot landed, it didn't matter. I was laying up no matter what. So at that point, I didn't, 
Allie had told me after I threw it in the woods, all you need to do is par. So, you know, at that point I was like, okay, just get up and down for par. That's all that matters. But it was very situational. I think certain courses I would want to know going into 17 up before 17 I'm just playing smart. I'm trying to birdie. If I'm out of position, I'm laying yeah, up. Like, the game plan doesn't really it doesn't, change. It doesn't change. If I'm losing, tied, winning by four, I'm going to try to throw a good shot on 16. I'm going to try to throw a good shot on 17. Like My game plan's not changing. So yeah. me knowing doesn't do any good for me. Now that I know that people don't watch, if I'm ever in the hunt going into 18, <laughs> I'm going to be like, whew. Good thing you got a one-stroke lead there, Proctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're li- you're winning by one. You're like, gosh, you got me by one here, man. I'm gonna have to throw in or Good something. Win. No, I won't yeah. go that far. I won't yeah. go that far, but. Uh, so, do you think yeah. that's a flaw in course designs to where you're not really caring about the score down the stretch because your game plan wouldn't change? Like, do you want to play on courses where? this your score matters down the stretch and how how you play the holes will change i think i mean you know if we're talking about maple is 17 like the best hole in the course no you know you're trying to bird everyone's trying to birdie it um i don't really know how you would change that i think maple is a great course i think you know the finishing stretch birdieing i think 14 is a super swing hole 15 being kind of a must birdie like strokes are to be had there 16 obviously so i don't think it's necessarily a flaw on course design i think it's more of my style of play to where i'm not really going to get baited into doing something i'm not comfortable doing and i'm not really going to change my shot a whole lot like i'm kind of a high percentage gap trust my putt guy i'm not trying to park the hole i'm trying to give myself a look and knock down the putt And so my game plan doesn't get persuaded too much, depending on how the course is laid out. You know, um, I'm trying to think like for USCGC, you're trying to birdie 16, 17. I might play it safer on the Island, but I'm still going for the Island Mm -hmm. and trusting myself to make the putt. Even if I have to go birdie birdie to finish, I'm not going to try to park 17. I'm going to throw it to the meat of the Island and make the 30 footer. Um, And then 18 plays how 18 plays, but you know, I don't think it's necessarily a huge knock on course design. I think it's just more of my style of play. Gotcha. Are you, are we going to see you with like uh, horse blinders? If like disc golf ever starts getting like the score keepers out there and the big scoreboards and everything, are you just going to have to like walk I mean, in so you don't see any of that? Like they had the scoreboard and I could just, I chose just not to look at it. Like I noticed it a couple of times and I noticed the names and I just looked away. But you know, after that put on 15, I had a camera in my face the entire rest of the round. I'm walking down the fairway. There's a camera right here. So I had an idea like, you know, I'm not, I don't know the exact scores. I don't know who the person is behind me. It could have been goose. It could have been Rick. I had no idea it was Paul, but I knew the situation. I knew if I kept birdie in, I was in control of my own destiny. You know, it's, it's the, you can't hide from all of it. Right. Gotcha. And you can kind of feel it too. Right. Yeah. Like you, yeah. You know, the crowd I'm playing and good stuff, and when yeah. I'm playing good, nobody's, nobody can do what I'm doing right now. I probably have this. Yeah. Like at least, you know, if I keep birdieing, I control my own destiny. Yeah. And that's kind of what I told myself. Like, it doesn't matter who's behind me or who in, who's in front of me. You know, if I throw this tee shot good and I make the putt, that's, it is what it is. Where, where do you rank yourself on, on tour for putting? Where would you we put talk, yourself? I mean, so, you know, everyone says Marweed's name first and I agree circle one. I can't, I mean, Paul's had an incredible season as well. So I would put Paul's name in there. If you're talking putting. Yeah. I think that includes, putting. I think Inside that includes C1 feet. and C2. Yep. I'm putting my name at the top. Um, you know, I know bell has had a great season putting both too. Gannon, I think it's situational as well. You know, both of my wins have been with putting down the stretch. Yeah. Um, it's something I hold a lot of pride in. So, you know, I think, I think there's a handful of guys that any given week can, are, are going to be number one, are going to lead the field in putting. Um, but I think, you know, if you include C1 and C2 and you include situational, I, I'm putting my name up there. Yeah. I like it. I was saying the whole week on Jomez, I don't know if you watched any of the coverage or whatever, but I'm like, I kept saying like, no, this guy's the best putter in the world. 
everybody yeah. talks about Gannon. I'm like, no, you don't understand. Proctor's cold, man. He's cold. And then, uh, you know, Jeremy even said it like down the stretch. He was like, man, you've been calling this the whole time. And so thanks for making me look good on there because <laughs> I've been, I've been pushing the Proctor name on top with Gannon and those guys for a very, very long time. I appreciate what, you. Do I, you. I had to call like Jeremy out a little bit. So you yeah. have a bad putting day. Yeah, I do. But honestly, a bad putting day for me is like, you know, if I miss two C ones, that's awful. Okay. I'll give myself one miss. Putting's not easy. You're going to have, you know, you're going to miss every now and then. Like, I'm not like, Oh, I got to be perfect. But there's not a, a day, day where you wake up and you're just like, I, I can't hit the basket. Like that doesn't exist. Okay. Like, no, that's silly. That's huh? silly no. stuff. <laughs> All, right. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Um, How long has it been like that? I'd say the last two years. I mean, three years ago, I was not great. I was not great at C2. I was, I had a little bit less spin on my putt. And I would come up short a lot or I would put them too high and I was trying to loft them. And so that off season after the 2022 season, I started spin putting a lot just to teach myself to have more spin. Um, and then kind of worked it back into my normal putt just with some more spin. And that gave me more range. And I think the last two seasons, you know, I've felt extremely confident on the putting green. Yep. Love that. Uh, you want to give me a little breakdown? Uh, Cause I think you're probably the highest yeah, I think you're the highest profile player that isn't signed under one big disc contract, right? You mm-hmm. you kind of went the open bag route. So can you give a little bit more of a breakdown of what that looks like and how that works for you? I mean, so my my two main sponsors are Infinite and Dot Space, and they both pay me the same. They're 50-50. Um, I have a smaller company, Alpha, out of Norway that supports me, and, and I have a signature disc with them. But, you know... As far as my contract state, I have to throw one mold from each company and the rest of my bag can be filled with whatever I want. Um, you know, and the beauty of infinite is like, for example, I throw a zone and I can just, you know, I do my in the bag. Here's my zone. You can find them on infinite. You can find them on Discraft, obviously, but that way I'm still able to plug infinite. Um, but I think, you know, Aaron is the owner of thought space and one of their main best selling discs is the pathfinder. It's a straight mid range. And the fact that I'm able to throw a rock or a buzz or, you know, whatever other mid rangers are on the market, but I choose to throw a pathfinder has some weight to it. The fact that I, I make that choice and I still throw the pathfinder over those other mid ranges. So, you know, um, he kind of worded it that way. And, and I kind of use that as a selling point, but honestly, you know, I mean, everyone's making good discs now. Um, but I believe in the product. And so, you know, my bag's kind of a mix. I still have a lot of old Innova. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I get supported by multiple companies. They don't have to, you know, cut the huge check as if they're, as if they were the sole sponsor, they can, they can split it 50, 50. Um, and then, you know, for me, I have, you know, it, it kind of adds up to a decent amount, probably comparable to what I would be getting at, at other bigger companies. It's just split up between a couple smaller ones. How much so are what, we talking to get a cap wrap uh, in there per month? <laughs> Honestly, you know, yeah, I've thrown message me a little bit, you know, <laughs> I, I threw the, what were the ones that, that those, the first like jawbreaker Z, Z the flex. ones that came out that corns had in Seattle and the Jack Washington Raiders tournament. Flex, mm-hmm. Yeah. Those ones have been, have made appearances in my bag. Okay, so, okay. you know, I, uh, but I haven't had a cap wrap yet. So maybe I'll got to test one of those out. Test it out. Maybe we can come up with a number. So, right. what, you know, after, after having success this year, you know, two wins, that's your, this has definitely been your most successful year. You're being open bag. I'm sure you love the discs that are in your bag. Does that mean that if someone was to come to say, Hey, we want you to only throw disc craft. We want you to only throw latitude. We want you to only throw disc mania. Does that come with a premium then? Or are you willing to do like a one-on-one switch? If you're getting, being able to get paid and they're going to be able to promote you, is like, how, how does that look for you? Are you going to, are you going to have to be like, Hey, you got to roll out the little red carpet for me to want to switch right now. I mean, I'm not motivated to switch. I like where I'm at. You know, I love working with the smaller companies. Um, I like my bag, obviously at the end of the day, you know, it's a business decision. If someone were to offer me something that was substantially more than what I was getting, I would be very motivated to make that switch. Um, but you know, I know, I know the market's crazy right now. I know a lot of teams are are changing 
their teams and, and the way they sponsor players. And, you know, I think this off season is going to be kind of wild. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm very thankful to be where I'm at and, and with the companies I'm with. And, um, you know, I'm not motivated to go out and, and seek, you know, a big deal or, or a different contract. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, if, if one presented itself, yeah, I, I would probably have a decision to make. Yeah. My go ahead. Eli. I was, I was going to take them back off topic. So if you have another, uh, no, no go. Yeah. So last year breakout season, um, you know, you finished, I think top 10 in pro tour points, you're way up there. And then this season starting off, the finishes weren't like last year. And then all of a sudden something flipped, um, you know, you win the Swedish open, you have a couple good finishes and then Maple Hill, obviously after last year, you're probably motivated to win. You're like, okay, I got the feel for the tour and now it's time for me to get the big win. Um, was that tough with the tough start that you had to, to remain confident and be like, no, I'm still Proctor. I, I proved last year that I can get in contention or what was that like mental battle with for the first half of the year or till you won Swedish open? Cause we weren't seeing you on lead cards. Like we were accustomed to. It was super tough. I had, you know, I, I had to, I was chasing those finishes from last year. Um, and I was searching for reasons why I wasn't performing as well. And, you know, I kind of had to check myself. I started caring more about my finishes and placements than I did about enjoying the game. And that's, I think what contributed to a lot of my success in 2023 is I was just having so much fun out there. And so, yeah, I had to kind of take a step back, um, and and really just try to find the love of the game again and enjoy myself and, and kind of let things happen. I think I was trying to force them in the beginning of the season. And, you know, I, I think the first three tournaments, I got like 23rd, 24th and 28th. And from then on, I was, I was, you know, just searching for that top 10 and searching for this. And it was becoming more frustrating. And I just felt like I kind of lost what I had. And so I stopped those comparisons and, and really just had to separate my identity from those results and, and just fall in love with the game again and enjoy playing and, and, uh, you know, I think that's one of the reasons I've been able to find success in the second half of the season is, is I'm just back to having fun again. There was someone that made a comment and I'm sure you didn't, you didn't see it cause you're, you're not paying attention to the comments, which is a very smart man, very smart man. <laughs> but, uh, they made a comment after you won at Maple Hill. And I think this goes to show two things. One, uh, sports fans in general are very like, what have you done for me now? Uh, like very biased in the short term. And then also to like sports fan are also very um, uneducated. I think sometimes when it comes to like the overall landscape of the sport, because someone was like, I like watching James Proctor win. Cause it shows that any of us can go out there and win. And it's like, <laughs> James Proctor is one of the best disc golfers in the world, ladies and gentlemen, what are we doing here? But that just kind of shows you like, you know, you had kind of a slow start, like Yuli was saying, and people just like kind of forget like, Oh no, that James Proctor is actually a really good disc golfer. Um, so it was really cool to kind of see you spin that because now two wins under your belt moving forward, you know, now that's going to put a little bit more pressure, I think on you, cause you're going to have the eyeballs on you of where, you know, beginning of the season, you kind of come off to a slow start. No one's really looking at you and being like, what's going on with James Proctor? Why is he off to a slow start? But going into next year, you are going to have that pressure of where, People are going to be scrolling down the leaderboard to try to find your name. So is that, is that something that you like to have? You you enjoy having that kind of pressure? I mean, I had that pressure on myself all season, you know, whether other people were seeing it or not, but I don't really think of it as pressure. You know, I think it's a confidence boost for me, but at the end of the day, I play my best golf when I'm having fun and I could care less about the results. Um, You know, going into that round, I would, I would have been happy with a top three. I was going to let Rick and Gannon battle it out. And I would have taken a top three as a win, you know, after Rick got off to a hot start and I bogeyed all seven, I was back to just having fun. And I think honestly that bogey on seven is what won the tournament for me. Cause I stopped wow. caring really at all about winning or what my finish was going to be, you know? Um, and so that's not going to change next year. And that's not going to change for these last two events this season. I think, you know, I'm just going to go out there and have fun. And I found the joy in disc golf again and competing and, you know, kind of developing my game plan and sticking to it. And um, 
so I'm, I'm really looking forward to next year and, you know, sort of have that monkey off my back. Yeah. There might be more pressure with it, but I'm not really looking at it, looking at it that way. You know, I think this first half of the season kind of taught me a lesson about worrying about finishes and results and, you know, the expectations I put on myself. So, um, I'm just going to try to, you know, enjoy it and, and really just keep having fun with it. And, um, yeah, we'll see, you know, kind of how that plays out, but I'm not going to fall into that trap. Like I did at the beginning of this year. Love that. Uh, before you go, let's throw up, uh, let's throw up some Madden rankings for you. I don't know. If we had these last time, but this is basically, uh, we got Edwin stats here throwing down all your rankings here. So this is based off of the touring pros that have played enough events to qualify for this, right? So okay. 75, I believe is going to be the lowest. Is that, is it the lowest 75 or is that the average? I can't remember. Uh, Edwin will let me know, but I'll read this off for our podcast listeners. We have scoring at 90 power at 90 accuracy at 85 scramble at 91 putting at 96 and an overall of 90. Oh, sorry. It says right there. 85, 85 is NPO average. 70 is the lowest there. So you are above average in everything average in the accuracy department. Um, some of the calculations here, scoring your birdie rate is 19th on tour putting C one X your fifth C two putting your second accuracy, your 67th in fairway 45 green and regulation 37 and OB rate scramble. You are eighth. And, uh, I, I'm, I would love to have seen like what you would be at like the second half of the season. Cause like you said, you kind of got off to a slow start. So I'm sure some of those numbers, but just looking at this, what were your thoughts? Is, is anything low in your opinion? Anything need to be higher? I mean, I'm shocked that I'm eighth in scrambling. I think, you know, I'm not one of those like wicked forehand guys. I have a great backhand, um, you know, Heiser flips and flippy discs and stuff like that. But it, it makes me happy to see that I'm that high in scrambling, you know, just, I feel like scrambling is a lot of forehand kind of working angles and that's something I've been working on. It's something I've gotten better at, but you know, that makes me happy. I think, um, you know, I, I think accuracy is probably fair. Some, some weeks I'm definitely far more accurate than others, but I'm not, you know, one of those super just always putting for birdie type of guys. Um, but you know, when I do get birdie looks, I knock them down. So I think 96 is, is it was it 96 for putting 96 for putting. Yeah. Fifth, yeah, I mean, fifth I, in C one X and second in C two. You know, I, I think that could be a 97 or a 98 in putting, but at the end of the day, you know, I can't complain about those numbers. I definitely think I'm a stronger putter than a thrower. So that's, uh, they look, they look accurate, but definitely that scrambling, um, both where I'm at in the pro tour and that ranking, you know, that makes me happy. Cause that's kind of been a weakness in the past. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with just keeping it in bounds. Once you throw out of bounds, it's pretty tough to scramble. So, yeah, you're um, the, you're currently the highest putting, uh, stat so far on the show. Okay. And we've, right. we've, we've had a decent amount of people on the show. <laughs> we've so. had the Rickster and Gannon on here. Yeah, so we've, Isaac, we've had, we've had a lot of good yeah, putters on here. Some good putters. Some good putters. Um, yeah. I got, Go ahead, I got a question for you though, especially yeah. going into these last tournaments, you know, the next question and the next step for you is a major championship. You've got the two, you know, elite series, you get Maple Hill. That's like the highest that you could do with the elite series plus being a playoff event and everything you're, you said you're, you play your best when you have fun and you don't care, but we all think it, you know, once those things are done, what's the next goal? Is that something that's in the back of your mind? Like you could be a major champion or are you just going to go out there and see what's what? I mean, Yes and no. Like, honestly, if you asked me before Swedish open and if you asked me before Maple Hill, like, you know, do you think you can win this? Or, you know, is it your goal to get an elite series win? I would have said probably not. You know, I've never played that great at Maple in the past. I didn't even cash at MVP or I mean at, at uh, green mountain. Um, you know, I got like 30, whatever, but because the field was so small, I missed cash. So I think, you know, I'm not going to go chase something. If it happens, if I have the opportunity, if I'm lead card last round, yeah, those thoughts will pop into my head. But, you know, I you can't win the tournament round one. You can't win the tournament in practice. You can prepare for it. 
but it's a marathon. And, and, you know, my goal really is just going to be keeping myself in contention and giving myself opportunities. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if I can do that and it, and it happens to be the week of a major, I mean, I'm going to do my best to go take it down and I'm going to have the confidence that I can, you know, I think, I think this, um, the MVP win kind of showed me that, you know, I mean, Gannon's best player in the world right now, Rick's having an incredible season. And, um, you know, I came out on top. So, you know, I'll take that confidence with me for sure, but I'm not going to go out and chase something. Um, I'm more of a keep yourself in contention and then, you know, go attack it on the last nine holes or something, but you can't win the tournament day one. So I'm not going to be too focused on that until that opportunity prevents itself. I've got two more questions for you. Yeah. First off, which major as it stands right now, do you think you have the best chance to win? Which one do you feel like the most confident? Um, that's a great one. I would say, you know, my forehand is feeling good and I know, you know, anything can happen on this course. So I feel good going into this week. Um, I think I would say European open would be, I have experience there, but that's a tough one as well. I would say honestly, champions cup next year. Like I know OTB is kind of a longer course. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, you know, if, if, if you're just throwing decent tee shots and giving yourself opportunities, I can put my way to a victory out there. And, and yeah, I think, you know, any of the majors really, it's just, for me, it's just about getting off to a solid start. I think if, if I shoot a good round one and I kind of, you know, it's so hard to catch guys. If you're, if you're off oh. to a slow start, like, like this field is way too good. Yeah. You're toast. And so, you know, I think, I think any of them, you know, Honestly, if you would have asked, like, what are my odds of winning Maple Hill as opposed to some other elite events throughout the year, I would have said, you know, very low. I had not done well in the past. Um, so I think that tournament kind of just proved to me, you know, you can win it can be any course. <laughs> yeah. It can be any course. Yeah. Just give yourself the opportunity. Just stay in it. You don't have to, you know, I mean, I was what, five back of Rick or four back of Rick with 10 holes to go, you know, so I think it was six. Yeah. Yeah. Even more. So, I mean, it just goes to show you like any course, any time, just if you're, if you happen to be there, go take it. But all right. Final I, question from me. Yeah. We just talked about how incredible of a putter you are. Not that long ago, you were on the bag of someone that would <laughs> probably win almost every single event. If they were like a decent putter. Mm -hmm. talk to me how how was that final round being on the bag like with someone that you could clearly be seeing like having a complete you know uh, almost i don't know what the right word of it was but like someone that was just falling apart confidence wise and obviously we're talking about evelina here at the world championship like what what was what was going on were you saying stuff were you try or were you trying to just act like it didn't happen let's move on to the next shot what was going on through that round because for I those was, that don't know you were chatting for evelina yeah and i was i was trying to coach her through it the best that i could it's such a mental block with her you know she's ready to go she's pissed off she's making the next putt because i tell her like all the time she'll miss the first putt get pissed off and then make the comebacker. Yeah. Like very, you know, she doesn't often three putt or four putt anymore. Sometimes it happens, but looking back on that round, I think it was hole 12. She threw her drive out of bounds, missed the putt, then missed the comebacker. And then she was like ready to give up. And she was like, mm -hmm. I'm done. And I said, no, you're not, you know? And the one thing I told her, um, before her birdie putt on 13, I said, don't think about the putt. Don't think about the putter. Think about your feet, you know, walk up there, make sure your feet are set and balanced and then go, don't give yourself time to think about anything else. Um, and you know, I can't take credit for what she did. She finished that round amazingly, but she did make that putt on 13. Um, and I think that gave her a little bit of confidence, but for her, you know, we've been talking about it all year and we, it's so funny because we'll go putt and, and in practice, she's great. And she even puts harder. 
And, you know, Hannah calls it the bullet putt and she'll just send it in there. And it's still, you know, an average pace, but for her, it's putting hard, Mm -hmm. but she's mortified to airball it and have a long comebacker in her head. All she thinks about is how long is my comeback putt? And so in the tournament, that's why she gets that little soft thing. And so, you know, I've been encouraging her more and more to, to just do her bullet putt and just get used to committing to it because she makes so many of them. And so, you know, she's, she's been working on that and and I think we're going to see it these last two events. Um, but yeah, it's so, you know, I, I was listening to podcasts about the yips, like after that week, I think maybe even before that week, mm-hmm. just really trying to think about different ways that I could help her and, you know, think about different things that I could say that would trigger something for her or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but you know, I think you're right. I mean, she's the best thrower I've ever, I've ever seen. And, you know, I think that one round in world, she was 18 for 18 with birdie putts. Yeah. New and, London, and which New is London. Not, not easy to do for no. anyone that's played out there. And I'm pretty sure there's, we played the same pad on a, a couple significant holes. number I think of holes. I think it's like three or four holes. We play the same pad. Yeah. No, no, it's more, it's like seven or oh, eight for, holes. I'm pretty sure. Worlds? Yeah. It might be different. For worlds. Yeah. 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 Like they, I mean, she's an incredible thrower and, you know, I think the putt for her, it's been years of, of trauma honestly and you know overcoming that is not easy so um but she's she's trying some things she's working some things out and uh you know i i hope the next two weeks go very well for her yeah because i think this is something that a lot of people can relate to you know because like you were saying as good of a putter you are putting is still challenging it is still difficult um Mm -hmm. especially at the amateur level and at a level of where like you said you have the yips we've seen it multiple times katrina allen we've seen katrina like change jennifer allen we've seen jennifer change the way that she puts uh we just saw it again with ali smith this year where Mm -hmm. she's like trying to turbo putt from like five feet and I'm just like what is happening so for those people that have the yips do you do you suggest just straight up like deconstructing like just completely change your style of putt and try something different I mean I suggest trying whatever you can think of like you know obviously don't give up you're not going to putt your way out of it by trying the same thing over and over because it's such a I mean, all of the people you've named, and I can speak for Evelyn and Allie firsthand, their practice rounds, their practice putting, it's fine. But as soon as the tournament kicks in, as soon as it really matters, it's not that it's, it's, it's a mental block and their hand is not attached to their brain anymore. You know, that change with a different style of putt, you think? Yes. Okay. I think, I think there's a chance. I mean, maybe not for everyone, but I think it's worth a shot. Because like Evelina's putt is similar to like an Isaac Robinson in a way of that they really just fling it out there and they put a lot of spin on it. Like the way that she kind of opens and closes her hand is what I'm saying. She has Mm -hmm. a very spinny putt. Mm -hmm. And when you watch Isaac putt, he putts everywhere. Same thing with Ezra Robinson. They putt everywhere like they're going to make it. Yeah. And so when they're putting like that, it's just like you're saying the bullet putt. It's just boom, boom, boom. And when you have that like snap putt, that's so reliant on the wrist snap and you're not confident and you've got the yips like you, uh, that Evelina has, like that's where it like flutters out of her hand and it just is like a dead putt. Yeah. So like maybe changing the actual, like reconstructing your putt completely to where you're not so reliant on the snap and you're reliant more on an elbow shoulder. Maybe that's something that's easy to replicate because like you're saying, it's all mental. If it is something that they, if she's making putts in practice and then in tournaments, she's not making putts. Clearly it's all mental. So maybe there is some sort of putt that is better for the pressure to where you're yeah. not having to rely on that confidence at the end to snap your wrist. Yeah. hundred percent. I, I don't disagree with you. I think, you know, Evelina, it's funny. We, I think Ricky actually discovered it. She would in tournaments, she would have her thumb on the disc draw it back and her thumb would come off and oh slide to like the very edge. And then she would go. And so we've been working the last two weeks on like thumb is staying on. Like you do not lift your thumb off the putter when you go. And it's, it's scary because it's new, but it's helping her. Um, and so I think, you know, focusing on that might take Did her mind off. Other was things. Happening? No, she had no idea. Oh my God. She had no idea. <laughs> yeah. It was bizarre. 
there's a she has a video of it on her phone like realizing it and it's like how what the I, yeah i don't know i i mean she has really small hands you know i don't know but this i don't know where to that Yuli's point this goes to yuli's point about the fpo field it's that's a valid point as well you know i think it's a very valid point um but you get, I mean, you look at guys like Rick and Gannon and how much pop they generate by, you know, whether it's hands, wrists, fingers, I don't even know how they do it. I've tried to do it. I can't do it either. I have really small hands for my size, but yeah, I don't, it, that was like startling though. And so I think, you know, I'm hoping that that's going to lead to some more success, realizing that she was doing that and kind of fixing that. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I used to do that back in the day myself, my, my thumb would slide. And when really? I, when I, yeah, That's yeah, crazy. for sure. And I, f- I finally was like, why is my thumb sliding? And it was just like a natural thing that I had always done. And it took me a long, long time to be like, don't slide. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's How? what Evelyn is doing right now. Or you can be like Anthon, his thumb comes off the disc when he throws, mm-hmm. which oh, is kind of crazy. Gosh. Yeah. How, uh, how tight were you clinching those cheeks when Evelina threw that putt on 18 layup and it hit the pole? I didn't like, even see it. I don't know what I was looking at. I had, I think I had a PDGA guy in my ear saying, do not let Evelina drink the champagne until they do the scorecards. Wait, before she had won the tournament. Like as she was like laying up to tap in. Yeah. Cause they That's had a, crazy. I went over there cause I was trying to get Hannah on the, I was going to give Hannah my caddy bib so she could be out there. Okay. And Hannah already had the champagne. Oh, you're already off the course. Okay. I gotcha. I was, well, they were on 18 screen. And sure. so I was over there talking cause they were, you know, 30 feet from the basket and they were like, no, we're going to let them out. And, and, but they were like, go tell Evelyn, like, do not let her, <laughs> you know, get, get champagne, drink champagne before she does the scorecards. And oh. so as she was laying up, I was kind of like walking back over. So I didn't even see it. Oh my God. Have you looked at it after the fact? <laughs> I've, I've seen, I've seen oh it my after. Gosh. Yeah, I was for a second after. there. I was like, Oh boy, we're going to have something <laughs> interesting happening here. Yeah. Oh yeah. man. Okay. Well, wild. Um, well, if, uh, if anyone's interested in putting tips, you can hit up Yuli. He's got the, uh, Academy that you can check out or Proctor, maybe this off season, a little putting tips around the I love Northwest. Talking about putting. Are you going to be in the it. Northwest this off season? I'll be in Northern California. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I mean, is that considered um, the Northwest? I don't know. Um, man, yeah, really it's consider- just Cali. Is that it's the Cali. West? Yeah. Okay. I only heard like the, like Pacific Northwest PNW when I was up in like Seattle, Oregon. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's just Cali. I don't. I don't want to disrespect anyone. All yeah, right, no, you're good. <laughs> you'll be on Cali. Okay, yep. fair enough. All right, brother. Well, uh, if you got anything to plug right now, plug plug away. If you got social media yeah. accounts, discs, anything like that, we got the new Thought Space Crux actually dropping tomorrow. Uh, very limited on the Thought Space website, but there'll a bunch available on the Infinite website. So check those out. And then yeah, you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and. Um, yeah, maybe we'll do some putting videos this off season. We'll see about that. Love it. Love it. Love it. <laughs>